Welcome to Worship with Minnehaha United Methodist Church on this second Sunday of Advent. I am Becky Sechrist, the pastor, and I am glad that you have joined us for worship this day. There are a few things that you need to know. One is that if you need a bulletin, which will have uh, the order of service and words to the prayers and the hymns, if you need that, uh, you can find that attached either to the email that you got or it's on our website, and you'll also find it connected there near the video. And if you didn't get an email and you would like to be getting emails from us, please uh, let us know that. There is a way to sign up to get our regular emails on the website, and that'll also get you the links to our classes and our events for youth and children, as well as uh, notices So, uh, and for coffee art. And so if you would like to have those links, please do sign up so that we can be sending those to you. The other thing is that uh, I know that it's hard to sing all by yourself. Well, maybe it's not hard to sing all by yourself in your house. Maybe you're quite used to doing that. But in case that feels a little awkward, uh, just know that you are singing and the rest of us are singing and our voices all join together in some way and that our musicians also sang by themselves as they created this worship service. So just uh, sing and join your voices. Imagine hearing all those other voices in your head. At any rate, uh, I am glad that you are joining us for worship, and now the Hicks family is going to light the candles in our Advent wreath for us. Advent continues as we light the first candle in our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. Now we light the second candle, the candle of peace. Last week, the frail light of a single candle held our hope in the midst of darkness. This second candle, too, must brave the darkness. In an age when people are seldom able to find peace within themselves, and when all the earth stands under the threat of division and violence, we light the fire of peace. We light it not for, just for the absence of war and conflict, but for peace, which is blessing and justice for everyone. By following Christ's teachings, we nurture our hope and work for peace. Sing to 
And now it is time for our morning prayer together. And so again, in that bulletin, you'll find a list of the people that we are holding in our prayers. And just a reminder that we are holding in our prayers Annette Meyer's extended family. Her stepmother, Betty Pettit, died on November 30th. And so prayers for her family and all their extended family as they grieve her death. Also, we hold in our prayers Arlene Forsberg, member of our congregation and the mother of Diane Engi. Arlene uh, did successfully move into a care facility up in Thief River Falls, but there has been a COVID outbreak in that facility, and uh, Arlene has gotten COVID so, and, and has symptoms of it. So uh, prayers for her and uh, for strength. Uh, to get through this and also for all of those who are caring for her and her family who is very worried and unable, of course, to be with her. So prayers for Arlene Forsberg and her family. We also have prayers of thanksgiving for good news about vaccines, especially the Pfizer vaccine that's been approved in Great Britain and for the people who will soon be able to get vaccinated there and the hope that that holds for the rest of us and the ability for that vaccine to uh, make it all the way around the world. And so uh, prayers for continued uh, good medical news around that vaccine and all the other vaccines out there. We also hold our Jewish brothers and sisters in our prayers. Hanukkah, their celebration begins at sundown on the 8th of December. So prayers for them as they enter into that celebratory season. And we, of course, hold in our prayers people the world over, including those in Trier, Germany, where a driver of an SUV zigzagged through a pedestrian area, killing uh, five people and wounding more than a dozen other people. And then whatever else has happened in the news or in our lives since uh, between when I record this and when you worship with this, hold all the people of the world, um, all the people of our community in your prayers. And so now let us join our voices together in our morning prayer. Holy center of this most holy season, Jesus, child and ruler, all our stars point to your birth. All our wanderings come home to you. All our griefs and delights find a place in the stable where you choose to transform poverty and pain and loneliness and rejection. Your light shines in our lives. Your peace embraces our anger, sorrow, and loss. Your life opens us to new discovery of our most intimate selves and of our neighbors, however we may find them, as poor as shepherds, as foreign as magi, as thoughtless as innkeepers, as helpless as infants. In your humble birth, we discover your everlasting majesty and grace. We welcome you and offer you our thanks and praise. Amen. And now let us be in a time of silent prayer. And now let us join our voices together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Creator, God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be with you on this second Sunday of Advent.
Last week, as we lit the first candle, we talked about holding hope in our lives. And this week, the focus is bringing peace. Now, there's different things that mean peace to each of us. And I think sometimes um, when we're thinking about just ourselves and what brings peace to our lives, it's good to think about what things help you calm down and breathe and focus on the present and give you a feeling of peacefulness in your soul. For me, candlelight is very helpful. So when I'm having a, a stressful, busy day, something that tells me it's time to calm down and to focus is lighting candles. I also have this little satchel that has lavender in it and the smell of that is a calming, peaceful thing for me. Sometimes we need something to do with our hands and that's part of why we do these coloring pages for Advent um, and you got these in your Advent kits, but there's coloring pages and just the process of sitting and coloring can be something that slows our minds and bodies down and help us to be at peace. But we're also called to work to bring peace to the earth, to everybody, and to all of creation. And so this week, as we think about bringing peace, it's good for us to not just think about what brings peace to our own lives, but what do others need for peace? And if we're hungry, it's hard to be at peace. If we don't know where we're going to sleep at night, it's hard to be at peace. There are things that we need to think about beyond ourselves that will help bring peace to the world. So I challenge you to talk with your brothers and sisters, with your parents, with people in your community, and see what you can do to bring peace to the bigger community this Advent. I invite you now to pass the peace of Christ with one another. So whether you're doing that with people in your own household or you are pausing this recording and sending a text or an email or making a phone call, or whether you are greeting people later, maybe at the grocery store or someone you run into as you walk around the neighborhood, just remember that we are always passing God's peace from God to all of those around us. Hey!
and the time has come for our offering. And so we are trusting you to make the effort to get that offering to us. And so we thank you for the ways in which you've been generous and for the many, 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 many of you who have gotten your pledge cards in. If you haven't gotten them in, it's not too late. It's never too late. Uh, so just go ahead and send those in. If you need another copy or you never got one to begin with, please contact us, office at minihaha.org. Let us know. We can get that information out to you. Uh, and then... There are a myriad of ways in which you can contribute. You can contribute uh, gifts of stock. You can uh, write us a check. You can download the Give Plus app onto your phone and give that way. You can use the QR code that's uh, located on your screen and pointing your camera phone at that. You can go to our website and use the PayPal account. All of those are ways in which you can give to the church. And so we thank you for the ways in which you live generous lives and the ways in which uh, you live out God's blessings in the world. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the 40th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to them, that they have served their term, that their penalty is paid, that they have received from the Lord's hand double for all their sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem of good tidings, Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and God's arm rules. The reward is with God, and the recompense before God. God will feed the flock like a shepherd, will gather the lambs in God's arms, and carry them in God's bosom, and gently lead the mother sheep. 
May God add blessing and understanding to this reading. Amen. Gun sales have been up this year. Uh, gun sales are always up in an election year, which is a little odd, but anyway. Um, but they are up this year more than usual. And they are up this year through non-traditional buyers. A large percentage of people buying guns this last year have been first-time buyers. Maybe some of you have been among those people who bought guns for the first time this year. Uh, certainly there was a round of gun sales at the time of the beginning of the pandemic and the lockdown, you can imagine. Uh, gun sales uh, went up then as people thought that they might need to protect the things that they had set aside. There were more gun sales after the death of George Floyd. Uh, there were people who purchased guns because they were worried that the police wouldn't be able to protect them anymore. There were people who bought guns for the first time because they were worried about right-wing extremism. And then there were the traditional reasons that people have bought guns in the past. And while we may not be able to all agree on whether buying a gun is the right answer to these things, I think we can agree that 2020 hasn't always brought out the best in us. I mean, there have been times that we have really rallied and been a community together, but 2020 has not, has not been a banner year for showing humanity's best side. And so Isaiah enters into our scene again, and thanks to Trevor for reading that passage for us. Isaiah enters into this scene of 2020 and the not best of us. And just a reminder, and I mentioned this last week as well, that the book of Isaiah was actually written by three different authors, at least three different authors, authors over the course of 200 years. And so we hear today from the, uh, the second author of the book of Isaiah. The first author warned the people about the impending disaster that was coming and God's displeasure with them. And then the first writer stopped writing at the time of the exile when the temple falls to Babylonians and the walls of Jerusalem fall and the upper and middle class of Hebrew people of the Israelites are taken away to Babylon, leaving only the poorest of the poor still living in the land of Jerusalem. And so the second author of Isaiah writes during this time of exile, an entire generation goes by as the people live in Babylon under foreign rule, not allowed to, to really state their own identity. And the passage for today comes towards the end of that time. And so a lot of things have transpired in that generation of people. The Babylonians themselves have fallen to somebody else, to the Persians. And so now the Persians are in control. And the the Israelites have some hope in this because it turns out that the king of Persia is a little more sympathetic to them than the rulers of Babylon had been. And so the Israelites really desperately want to return to their own land. They understand that they don't get to rule themselves anymore, that they're a vassal state. They, get to, you know, they don't get to have their own military, but they really want to go back to their land and they want to be able to rebuild the temple because there is so much of the worship life of Judaism that requires the temple. There are some things you can do without a temple, but there are certain laws of those 613 laws in Leviticus. Some of them require the temple. And so there's been a lot that the people have not been able to do. And so there's a little bit of, of hope. There's, there's some light at the end of their tunnel. They can, they can glimpse it. And so the author, the second author of Isaiah writes, comfort, Oh, comfort my people. You have paid for your sin. In the wilderness, prepare a way for God. And so the author writes this not because you need to prepare God's way, but because this is how people understood what happened. There had been a question. Once the temple fell, the people said, wait, but so if God lives in the temple, how is it that God was defeated by the Babylonians? That doesn't make any sense at all. I thought God was the ultimate ruler. Either that's not true, or, or, or our perceptions are all off. And so one of the writers of the time said, no, here's, I had a vision 
And the vision I saw was that God was so displeased with us. We had sinned so greatly that God left the temple. And I saw God exiting the temple and walking out into the wilderness, running into the wilderness. And so when the Babylonians broke down the wall and then came and broke down the temple, God wasn't there anymore. It was just an empty shell of a building. We, we were so far fallen from God that God was forced to leave us. And then we fell to the Babylonians. Now, I'm just saying that that's how the author at that time described what happened. It wouldn't maybe be the words I would use or the theology that I would have around what happened, but it was certainly how the people understood it. And so second, the second author of Isaiah is writing to those people with that understanding. And he's saying, I know, I know we thought that we had sinned so greatly and we were worried that God had actually abandoned us, but God didn't abandon us. God, yes, we, we sinned and God was displeased, but God never actually abandoned us. And now God is going to return. If we can come back to that land and rebuild that temple, God is going to, to return to it and live in it. And so in order to hasten that path, we're going to lift up all the valleys and bring down all the mountains and, and pave that road for God's return to Jerusalem. And in fact, our return to Jerusalem. And so that's what the author writes about, this, this hope, this thing that we can just see. It's just right on the edge of it. We're going to be able to go back home and we get to start again with God. He does acknowledge in the midst of that our own mortality, that we are like grass and flowers, and that that is in contrast to God's endurance. That God may have fled out into the wilderness, but God has great endurance and will never actually ever fully walk away from God's own people. The thing about Isaiah's vision, Isaiah's call, is that it's not a passive one. He doesn't say, sit back and watch what's going to happen. In fact, it starts with a call to action. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says God. God doesn't comfort the people. God, through Isaiah, says to the people, comfort. Comfort one another. You are all in exile. You are in a place that is strange. I mean, you've been there for a generation. Maybe it's not that strange anymore, but it's not home. Comfort one another and get ready to go back. You don't just passively wait for this to happen. Continue to appeal to the king so that we can return to our land. Pack your bags. Get ready to go. Look around at your family. Do you have aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, children that married outsiders, that married non-Jewish people? Get them ready. Have them bring their in-laws with them. We're all going back to Jerusalem. We don't want to leave anybody behind. So everybody needs to pack their bags, appeal to the king, and talk to one another about getting ready to go back. We need to encourage one another. That message that God has not abandoned us and that we get to try again is key, and everybody has to understand it. We lit the candle of peace today. And the call to peace is very similar to the call that Isaiah makes to the people living in exile. We are not passively watching and waiting for tranquility and serenity. Peace is not just sitting still and having a moment of silence. We are called to actively work for the things that will bring about peace. And maybe for you this summer, maybe it was that you planted a garden to remind ourselves of the earth and our work in it and what comes from it and the ways in which we can feed one another. Maybe for you, peace means that you are consciously purchasing from black and people of color owned businesses now. Maybe you are advocating for changes in our laws, in our practices, ways we fund local, state, and national budgets. 
Isaiah calls us to comfort one another. And so maybe you are bringing about peace by comforting one another. We all want to be done with 2020. But in the waning days of this year, in these days when we prepare for the coming of God in the form of a baby, let's let this year bring out the best in us. Let us let Isaiah's words call us to peace, a peace that comes with justice, a peace that gives everyone a chance to start over, a peace that brings God's words of comfort to everyone, a peace that invites God into our midst, a peace that levels the playing field, a peace that isn't necessarily tranquil, but is indeed true peace for all God's people. Amen. Yes, I should.
And now I send us out. And out might just be to your kitchen. I realize that. But let us serve God with patience and passion. Let us be deliberate in enacting our faith. Be steadfast in celebrating the Spirit's power. And may peace be our way in the world. Amen.